Okay, everyone. We're going to move on to the next thing, which is talking about smell. So here this guy is smelling the word smell. I wonder what it smells like. <laughs> okay, so as humans, we can experience a variety of smells. Here are some right here. Can anyone list what some of their favorite smells are? Cake batter. What, cake batter? What, what did you say? Oh, McDonald's. Okay. I think this is weird, but like a pool. Because like I'm ah, so, like, screwed. So like the smell of chlorine. Mm -hmm. It smells so clean, though. Yeah. Anyone else? The water at Disney World. Disney World has a smell? What does Disney World smell yeah. like? Oh, okay. They don't use chlorine. They use something else. Is it bromine, I think? Oh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you guys here just listed a huge diversity of smells, and in fact, as humans, we can actually smell trillions of smells. Okay, so over this course, we've talked about several different senses already. We talked about vision, we talked about thermosensation, mechanosensation, hearing. So what type of stimuli have we talked about so far? Victor at the beginning told us that every single stimuli is a type of energy. So think about the senses we talked about and tell me what source of stimuli we have looked at so far. So like for vision, what's, what's the stimuli for vision? Photons. Yes, light. Um, for mechanosensation? Well, mechanosensation, or like touching. Oh, okay. Temperature, <laughs> temperature yeah. sensation, or um, even hearing, actually. Yeah, so transducing yeah. some sort of energy into so we call that me mechanical stimulation, oh. basically, is what I'm trying to get at. Um, now we're going to move on to a new genre of senses or stimuli um, that's involved in smell and taste. Does anyone know what this genre is called? Smelling. Smelling is what you do, but what do you smell? You sense things. So what I'm looking at here is we don't have photons come up our nose, or that's not how we smell things, right? Uh, yeah. We also don't have mechanical stimuli, sound waves coming up our nose. <laughs> Instead, <laughs> we have chemicals. So all the things that we smell are made up of a variety of different chemicals, and that's what we sense in our noses when we smell. So let's quickly think about how a smell works. So you guys are very familiar with this now, so you know what I'm gonna ask you. So what is the stimuli um, for smell? Chemicals, right, and there's a specific word that we use, which is called an, oh, sorry, my animations are wrong, odorants. That's why it's deodorant. <laughs> yeah, odor is it smell. Yeah, <laughs> you got it. Oh my god. This is also a language class. You learn new things every day. Okay, does anyone know what receptors sense these odorants in the nose? Olfactory receptors, someone, someone read the, the handout, good job. Okay, so there's olfactory receptors, and where are they? In our nose. And we'll talk about more specifically where they are in the nose later. So once these receptors, olfactory receptors, are activated, they send our electrical signal or action potentials where? Does anyone know? To our brain, but through. <laughs> we need some sort of neuron, right? How are we going to transduce the chemical into an action potential? There's a name for it. <laughs> Olfactory nerve. Oh my god, that was such a good question. Yeah, so this um, conversion from odorants, like the chemicals in stinky socks, to an action potential in our olfactory nerve is called what type of transduction? You guys see it up there. Chemotransduction. So, so far we've talked about phototransduction, which is a conversion of light into an action potential. We've talked about mechanosensation, I mean, sorry, mechanotransduction, which is a conversion of mechanical energy into an action potential. And now we have chemotransduction. Yeah? Does that have anything to do with chemotherapy? I was thinking chemo. Uh, chemo just means chemical. So, <laughs> it can be used in a variety of words. So we now know that the olfactory nerve has to project to the brain. So what cortices do you think olfactory information goes to? What's the cortices? Um, like the visual cortex, or Maddie oh, told us about the auditory yes. cortex. Olfactory or olfactory. Waha! Yes, I just use olfactory two times. Yeah, exactly. So like, like Maddie said, scientists are very original, <laughs> so we tend to be consistent. 
Okay, so right, so we get stinky socks sensed by olfactory receptors in the nose. Um, the odors are transduced to action potentials in the olfactory nerve. These signals are sent to the olfactory cortex, and we get smell. So this is general schematic, but again, we want to go from structure to function. How does the structure of our nose allow us to smell things? How does the structure of our nerves and our brain allow us to smell things? So right here, we have a cross-section of our face. And you can see our nose and all the empty space in there. So where do, where does, uh, where do odorants enter our nose? Nostrils. Nostrils, right? And why do they enter our nose? What? Why do they enter? Yeah. Because we're oh. breathing. Yeah, so you're inhaling. inhaling. There's also passive diffusion in the air. So both of these methods allow us to draw air that has chemicals in it, odorants, into our nose. So these odorants enter the nasal cavity. Here, I'll just pull these things up here the nasal cavity, and you see this uh, spiky yellow thing up here? Yeah. So this is the olfactory um, nerve here, and these things bundle up into the olfactory bulb. The surface of the olfactory nerves is called the olfactory epithelium. So where do you think our receptors, our olfactory receptors, lie? Um, at the tips of the, yeah. Yeah, at the tips, yeah. Um, in the olfactory epithelium, that's correct. So if we zoom in a little bit, this is a, a cross-section of this spot right here. So we have air with odorant molecules um, coming into the nose, into the nasal cavity, and they bind to receptors, olfactory receptors, um, onto, on, on the uh, olfactory epithelium of each of these receptors. Do you see these little squiggly things right here? What, do you guys know what those are called? They look kind of like hairs, but uh, there's a specific scientific word that describes them. <laughs> so they're called cilia, uh, which you guys have probably heard before, like in terms of amoebas and things like that. So uh, we have a bunch of olfactory cilia that are at the end of these olfactory receptor cells. Why do you think we have so many cilia? A lot of smell different things. Yeah, so basically we, yeah, right. So we want to smell a lot of different things but also we want to be as sensitive as possible. Do you think it would be better to just have like one receptor per surface area, or do we want to optimize all the receptors that we can get in a specific area? Yeah. Yes, optimize, of course. We want to be as sensitive as possible. So all these cilia allow us to have like thousands and thousands of olfactory receptors um, in the surface of them. So like I was saying before, odorants bind to receptors on the olfactory um, at the the olfactory, the surface of the olfactory nerves. Um, and these olfactory nerves will send an action potential down, uh, yeah, and then they bundle into the olfactory nerve and they'll send an action potential to the brain. So we mentioned before that um, one smell or one thing that we smell is made up of actually a lot of different chemicals. So take, okay. Where? Where are you looking? Uh, the grapes. Yeah. <laughs> those, those are grapes. grapes. Those are grapes. <laughs> grapes. Down, down, down one, down one, yeah. stop, left, two, there. Strong. Oh, strong. I don't know, but it has a little exclamation point, which means it probably yeah, doesn't smell good somehow. Yeah. Is it dangerous? <laughs> That's usually what it means, but oh. I'm, I'm not sure. Don't smell that very so, like, look at all these um, pictures we have up here. So we have bananas. So if we want to smell bananas, what chemicals are bananas made out of? Ethanoate. Yeah. So well, we can have five parts. Five carbon pentyl. Wait, is it like that? Like five carbon pentyl, three carbons. Yeah. So pen, like pentagon, pen. It's five. Yeah. So I thought five carbons made of sugar. So all of these things actually make up various chemical compounds, like alcohol. So these are actually alcohols, so they're very volatile. That's why they can like evaporate into the air and you can smell them very well. And then also these are carboxylic acids. So bananas here have several different chemicals. So pentyl ethanoate and 2-methylpropyl butanoate. So these chemicals make up the smell of a banana. But how do we actually smell what a banana smells like? So I have a question for you guys. Remember, Victor used this schematic to talk about how we sense um, temperature. Do we have one neuron 
that's sensitive to a specific temperature, or is one neuron sensitive to multiple temperatures? So I'm asking you the same question here. Is one neuron sensitive to one odorant or one chemical, or can one neuron sense multiple? So in terms of bananas, say these three chemicals, odorants, make up what a banana smells like. Do we have one neuron sensing uh, each chemical individually or do we, to make it the smell of banana? Or do we have one banana with all these chemicals binding to a quote unquote banana neuron to wow. make it the smell of a banana? So give me a second to, you can start polling now. Oh, you guys voted really fast. OK, great. So results are, whoa. Ooh, OK, you guys learned something through this course. Uh, one person didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there, also, there actually are polymodal neurons. So you shouldn't okay. be too Not snappy. For Not for bananas, I guess. <laughs> but some neurons are able to sense a variety of things, like Victor told us, because thermosensitive neurons can also t sense chemicals like capsaicin, right? So OK. So you guys are right. Um, each receptor is responsible for sensing a different odorant. Oh, sorry, I meant to do this. <laughs> the answer is A. <laughs> and in fact, someone won the Nobel Prize for this uh, discovery. So they found, I think Axel and, and Buck, I think, uh, found that there's one gene that codes for one receptor. So each of these different receptors in the um, olfactory epithelium is coded by one gene. So how many genes do you think we need to smell all the smells that we smell? Yeah, like give me, OK, so you, you think 100,000. Does anyone else have an estimate for how many we need? 100,001. 100,001. I'd say about 384,000. Right, so there's how many genes in the human genome? Ah, that's a good point. Yeah, it's 500,000. I'm going to say 100,000. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so you guys have a lot of guesses. 40, this is how many there are. Can you count them really fast? Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. One, <laughs> two, three, four, five, thousand. OK, so yeah, right. how many is it? Um, the answer is, I just realized my slides are out of order. So, but the answer is around 400. We have 400 <gasps> olfactory <laughs> genes. Anyway. So, how do we get so many complex smells? We can smell trillions of things. How do we get that from 400 genes? Do you think oh. you can smell more than 400 things? Yeah. yeah. Maybe it's because like it's more like a code, so it's made up of different things. So it's like it's like A, B, C, D. It's like A and B make one thing, and then A and C make another. Yeah, that's great. So think about things that smell similar. So say you smell an orange and a lemon. Do you think they, s they on orange, <laughs> do you think they share some of the same chemicals? No, you, they, a, yes, they're completely they're different? They share A, but oh, they well, share B. Some receptors can be for two different things. Yeah, right. right so it's more simplified. <laughs> well, so there should be one, uh, yeah. Multiple things can be sensed by one receptor. But also, the smells in the world around us share multiple compounds. So um, oranges and lemons share a lot of similar chemicals, but there might be a difference in the number of one chemical in lemons over the, the chemi number of that same chemical in oranges. So the proportion of chemicals, the mixture of them, gives us the smell identity. So where do you think this um, smell identity comes from? Do you think it comes at this level of receptors? Do you think it's higher up in the brain or somewhere in the middle? There's kind of an answer on the screen, but like. Wait, wait, what was the question? Yeah, I didn't know. Where, where do you think the um, smell of a banana, like what level of the system do you think we smell a banana at? Do you think it's at this receptor level, or the brain level, or somewhere in between? Uh, the receptor level, yeah. I'm wrong. Maybe it's in the middle. The way you're closer to the <laughs> <laughs> so receptor, receptors are clearly oh, important, but remember each receptor yeah. senses is encoded by one gene and, encode, and is able to sense one chemical, or maybe a few chemicals. But so these receptors actually mix up further in the system, and um, this happens later in the brain. But there's these structures called glomeruli, glomerulus, or the plural is glomeruli. And basically what they are are bundles or groups of, um, of neurons that have the same 
uh, genetic identity. So all of the green cells come to this glomerulus, and all of the red cells come to this glomerulus, and all of the purple cells come to this, this glomerulus. Yeah? How many glomeruluses are there? That's a good question. I don't actually know. Um, but there can also be multiple glomeruli per receptor identity. So there's probably like hundreds of red glomeruli in the, um, ah, yeah. So the perception of a banana smell comes from actually the pattern and the temporal activation or how these um, neurons are activated in time um, of these glomeruli. So maybe like a banana is green, and purple, or yeah, green, purple, red. I don't know. So there's some sort of coding, and you had the word coding here. The idea that I'm trying to convey to you is that there's sensory coding at the level of these glomeruli, and um, there's also coding later on in the upper cortis cortices and the olfactory cortices. Yeah. So if they all converge to one strand thing, that means there's only like six different things it could be, combinations of those three. So how does it differentiate? what type of green is in the green? Yeah, so there's going to be more than three. There's going to be, like you said, there's 400 oh, oh, receptor yeah, genes. Yeah. So imagine yeah. at least one glomerulus per receptor. So we have at least 400 glomeruli, and I know we have multiple copies of each of those glomeruli. Um, so it's, it's also the spatial activation and the temporal activation. So basically, like you have all these keys on the piano, and when you play different ones at the same time, you get different sounds. So it's similar to this. When you activate different glomeruli at different times and in different locations, you get different smells. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So I mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is an area of active research. I think this one gene to one receptor was discovered in like 2010 or 2009. So it's actually a very recent uh, discovery. And uh, so a lot of scientists actually use fruit flies to investigate this question, and we'll do a, a little mini experiment later with fruit flies. So now what I want you guys to do is to test your sense of smell. We're going to do this smell identification activity. So we know that we can identify trillions of smells, but you may realize, similar to in hearing, that we use a lot of visual cues to identify smells. So we have three stations in the back, so if you guys can split up into groups of three, and there's also on the, back, on the back of your first page in this handout, there's a chart that has numbers and then blank spots. And I want you to try to guess the identity of each of these oh, smells. Yeah, yeah. But you guys, it's very important, do not look into the vials. So make sure no one's cheating. Yeah, so be more than half. <laughs> okay, you guys, do you want me to tell you the answers? Yes. Okay, so if you get it right, raise your hand, okay? Number one, vanilla extract. Whoa! Okay, you guys got that. Okay, number two, you, you can score yourselves too. Number two, mint. Yes. What? Yes. Okay. I told you, you put mint Number three, cinnamon. Let's go. Oh, that was my second choice. Three, three. Cinnamon. Number four, foods. Number four, Coffee. Oh, yeah. Everyone got that one, right? <laughs> okay, raise your hands though, because I'm curious. I want to see who got what. Okay, you guys all got coffee. Number five, rosemary. <laughs> I put that down. Who got rosemary? Okay, a few people. Number six, this one was really hard. What did you guys think it was? Peanuts. Peanuts? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. Lemony? A blank page. So the answer is chamomile. What is that? <laughs> it's, a, it's a type of tea. Yeah, yeah. Okay, number seven, olive oil. Yes. Okay, so people got that. Number eight, what do you think number eight was? Oregano. Yeah, it's oregano. Okay, what about number nine? Anyone have any guesses? Licor licorice, orange? It's um, anise, which is the same thing as licorice, basically. So it counts? Yeah, it counts. Okay, number 10, uh, coconut. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, number 11, what do you guys think? I thought it was steak powder. Steak powder. <laughs> I said curry powder. powder. Paprika yeah. or some spice? Though. Okay, so spice. The answer is curry powder. So it's a mixture yeah, of a bunch. So okay. Yeah. Super close. Okay, and then the last one, who has a guess? Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid nail polish. Kool nail polish, what did you say? 
Lemon juice. That's really close. It's orange extract. Okay, so score up. Score up how many you got. I got. How did I get Kool Aid? <laughs> okay, so you guys raise your hand if you got more than five right. Okay, great. What if you got more than uh, eight right? Kind of. It's cur curry powder. I'm not going to give you that one. Okay, so we got between five and eight. So you got like roughly half ish, a little bit better than half of the smells right. Okay, so just think about all these different smells that we can we can identify. Um, this is a direct product of how many genes we have. So to refresh your memory, how many genes do humans have? Olfactory oh, genes? Uh, I told you the answer before. Yeah, the closest one. This is the exact number, apparently. Oh yeah, use your clickers. Sorry, I need to start the thing. Okay, go now. Wow, you guys are fast. Okay, one more. Someone didn't vote yet. Go. Let's go, people. Answer the question. Oh, we have thirteen. Okay, make sure all the clickers are on. Okay, twelve. That's good enough. Okay. The answer is. Yay, most of you guys remember. Yeah, so roughly 400 or 396. OK. So we know as humans we can smell a lot of things. But for other animals, smell might be more or less important. So here's an interesting question. How many olfactory genes do you think cows have? More because they smell grass or something. OK, so go ahead and vote. I think they have more. Okay, great. And you guys said, okay, so either 15, 800, or 4,000. The answer is 801. So four people got it right. So cows smell better than us. And in fact, cow, I mean, many animals smell better than us. I hate to break it to you guys, but we're actually really bad at smelling. Um, and look at this diagram to understand. So this is the number of olfactory receptor genes that we have. So here we are, like, almost at the bottom. Only some other monkeys are worse than us. And who is the champion? Elephant, because they got that big nose. That doesn't So they do have a big nose. Um, but they also, I mean, each of these animals has different challenges in their environment. Why do you think an elephant needs to have really good smell? Don't they have really good memory? They do have very good memory too, and smell is associated with memory. But like, think about where elephants live. Do they live in like a rainforest? Do they live in a desert? Do they live in well, deserts, right? And so they have um, very scarce resources. So they need to find things like water. So elephants can smell water from like 20 miles away. Smell water? Yeah. So when you go outside, you can smell humidity, kind of, right? When it, when it rains, and they can smell something similar. Yeah. Did we develop uh, more receptors over time as we evolved? I so I don't know, but considering that these other um, monkeys have fewer genes than us, it kind of seems like either we stayed the same or maybe we advanced a little bit. But think about the other senses that we have in our body that are extremely important, like vision. So our vision, like we saw compared to the dog's vision, so they ha dogs have better smell than us, but we have better vision than dogs. So it's just a matter of how much space we have in our brain for different senses and the relative importance of those senses to us. Yeah. Okay, so you said how like elephants can like smell water, right? Mm hmm How can they smell water if it doesn't smell like it? So when you go outside, can you smell when it rains? Yeah. yeah. My shirt smelled like rain yesterday. <laughs> Your shirt smelled like rain. It's because things like dirt have different chemicals. And in fact, if anyone's from the southwest, rain smells very different because there's these creosote bushes. So um, chemicals are released, they, they dissolve in water, basically. Water is our universal solvent. So it's really the chemicals that are being released by the water that you're smelling, not the water itself. And by the way, that's maybe why we cannot smell the water, because we can only pour hydrogen. Uh, yeah, good point. <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, Yuri was telling us the other day about the sensory homunculus. Do you guys remember what that is? Uh, remember those two monsters uh, yeah. with like, the oh, really yeah. big hands? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, right. So the bigger the body organism or like the portion of the brain, um, the more sensitive um, we are in that like area. So it was fingertips for Yuri. So we can use a similar idea to think about how important olfaction is in humans versus other animals. So this is a human brain here, and these are our olfactory bulbs. <laughs> so look how small they are. Yeah. Now, look at this animal. What, first of all, what do you think this is? Uh, oh, that, that's got to be a raccoon. I don't <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of a canine. Well, it is a canine. It's a dog. It's a dog. Oh, okay. And where are the olfactory bulbs? Right here, so they're really big. What about this? That is That's a snake. It's a sheep. <laughs> and again, yeah. olfactory bulbs are much larger than they are in humans. What about this one? A fly. A fly. <laughs> it's a mouse brain, actually. So, like, look how big their olfactory bulbs are here. So we can kind of judge the importance of different senses by the structure of the brain. And this is one example. So. We touched on uh, smell being very important for animals, such as elephants. And I just want to impress upon you why it is so important. So think about what we do on a daily basis to find food. Do we have to hunt our food by sense of smell? No. Meat, no. Yes. <laughs> so other animals like bears need to be able to identify food by a sense of smell. Um, finding mates. I mean, generally we don't go around sniffing people <laughs> to find <laughs> mates, but other organisms do, yeah. But it's true. It is still an important cue for us, um, but perhaps not as important as some other animals. It's like one large. Also, oh. social cues. Um, <laughs> we generally don't do this. <laughs> but for other animals, it's essential for communication. And lastly, detecting danger. This dude is like dead right now. This man says, look, it's a Right, so this guy is detecting danger, and this guy is finding food. So, I mean, it's very clear to see that smell is more important to a lot of other animals than us, and that's because what? Because their environments, yeah. and biologically, they have more yeah. what? They have more receptors. receptors, because they have more Gen genes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. So now I want to give you some examples of super sensitive noses. So I already talked about Ew. bears a little bit, but bears can also smell like rotting carcasses from tens of miles away. Uh, yeah, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, so like, what if you um, domesticate, you know, like when we domesticate a dog, mm -hmm. do their receptor count go down? They don't really That's a really interesting question. I would, I would hypothesize that, yeah, their receptor um, density would decrease. However, you can also do the opposite. You can breed animals that are specialized in smell, like bloodhounds. So the average dog has um, a 300 times better smell, oh sorry, 100 times better smell than humans, but a bloodhound has 300 times better smell than humans. Wow. wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, rather than their so function. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we can change the number of olfactory genes, for example, based off of breeding. Uh, sharks, we've all heard that a shark can sense a smell like a drop of blood in the entire ocean. So I looked at some studies to see if this was actually true, and it turns out no. So if you take an average pool, how many drops, so I couldn't find blood, but how many drops of tuna oil do you think is necessary for a shark, to, a yellow, I think it's called a lemon shark, to sense this oh, smell? Shark. I thought it was like five parts per million. So I don't actually know the parts per million, five. but it comes out to, you think five? They need 10 drops of tuna oil in a normal sized pool. So if you have one drop of blood and you're swimming in the ocean, you're probably okay. Um, so you start bleeding out. Yeah, unless you start bleeding more. But in general, many aquatic animals have very good senses of smell, besides actually dolphins, which can't smell. 
Yeah, they, so they have other senses, and maybe that's why they don't need to smell so much. And then we talked about elef elephants that need to find water from far away. So not only um, do we have a lot of sensitive noses, but we have strange noses. And we talked before about how function determine, uh, sorry, structure determines function. And we have some examples here. So snakes have very good senses of smell, but they don't smell traditionally like we do. So instead what they do is they stick out their tongue. You guys have all seen a, a snake slither its tongue out, and it actually draws the tongue back into its mouth and whips it up against this organ called the Jacobson's organ. And that's how the odorants um, get contact with the olfactory receptors. So it's actually kind of like touch in a way. They have to touch. physically bring the smell outside to inside. Um, a lot of insects can actually smell not with their noses, but with their legs. So they have receptors on these hairs that are sensitive to odorants, different chemicals. And so if you've ever seen like a fly or something land on you and go like this, is smelling, is taste, or I guess smelling you, and also tasting you, but, <laughs> yeah. Do you guys know what this thing is? That's a cool little animal. It's a type of porcupine. Uh, it's a type of bird, but it's very round. It's a kiwi bird. Oh, I've heard of it. Don't those, like, cannot fly, though? Yeah, they can't fly very well, and they live in New Zealand, so, a lot of organisms have noses that are close to their faces, like at the base of their face, but instead they have their nostrils at the very tip of their nose. Why do you think they would want a nostril at the tip of their nose? It's close to the ground. Yeah, it's like it's, it's closer to whatever they're sniffing. Exactly. Um, crabs um, actually smell things by wafting on their arms. So these little hairs, so I guess they're kind of similar to insects and, and how they smell. And then lastly, there's bacteria. So you don't have to be like a multicellular organism to be very sensitive to chemicals. And this is actually something that's really important in biology as a whole, is sensing your surroundings. So bacteria are also very good at um, sensing odorants. OK, so now we have a few minutes left. And we're going to do a little experiment, a thought experiment. So here are some techniques that um, scientists use in the lab actually quite frequently to determine whether odorant receptors are present in a cell. So what do you guys think these are? I mean, I know it says it up there, but. Yeah, they're fruit fly larvae. And these are Petri dishes, and you can see the Petri dish is split in half. And there's this ball here um, that's soaked with some sort of odorant. So we know that odorants can be good smelling or bad smelling. So imagine that this, um, this little cotton thing right here is soaked with rotten banana smell, something that smells really good to flies. Which side of the petri dish do you think the fly larva will the go to? Towards the carnival. Yeah, towards the rotten banana side. So um, imagine, though, that this is an aversive stimuli, like some sort of like bug killer pesticide. Which way would it go? The, the opposite way, way. right. Yeah. So remember when Victor was showing us in the lab tour this preference test with the mice? And we talked about knockout animals and how you can determine whether an organism has a, recept a certain receptor or a certain gene by testing their behavior. So you can do a similar thing with fruit flies. So imagine instead of the two plates, we have these two sides of the Petri dish. So if you look in your this thing, there's a page here that has four different circles. And what I want you to do is imagine that you're a scientist and you think you've identified a novel odorant receptor. So a receptor that um, no one has discovered before and you think it senses a spe specific odorant. So first of all, you need to name that odorant. And then you need, to you need to come up with an experiment and a hypothesis for what the flies would do if you soak this little cotton thing with your specific odorant. Does that make any sense yeah. to you guys? Okay. So what we're going to do is split up into small groups, so maybe like three people per group. Um, come up with an odorant, come up with a hypothesis, and then draw the experimental outcomes and the control conditions. Do you guys remember what a control is? Yes. yes. OK, so let's see what you guys have. So go ahead and split up. We only have a few minutes, so we've got to be kind of fast. <laughs> 